This episode is brought to you by the all new Fresh Books, where you can create and send professional looking invoices in about 30 seconds. You can get a free 30 day trial. Just go to freshbooks.com slash RIP and enter rental income podcast in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. There are a ton of ways to finance rental properties. And if you want to grow your portfolio past a couple of rentals, commercial financing may be the way to help you get there. Now, it, it's called commercial financing, but these loans are actually made on residential real estate. So it's kind of a kind of a funny thing to call it a commercial loan when it's actually on residential real estate. But these are loans that banks make to just regular people, regular investors like us that want to buy rental properties. And there's banks out there, local community banks, and every town in this country has these local community banks that specialize in making real estate loans that don't go by the typical standards that you would find for your traditional Fannie and Freddie rental property loans. So I wanted to bring a commercial banker on today to talk about how this works to talk about what the banks are looking for and how we can take advantage of this to grow our portfolio. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll meet Elliot Colts. He is a banker with City National Bank in Stanton, Virginia. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. So Elliot, there's there's big banks, the Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, and then there's smaller community banks. Can you tell me kind of what different banks specialize in and why real estate investors may be better off choosing a community bank? Yes. One thing that is nice about a community bank is by being involved in the community, you know, they're more willing to want to uh, deal with those locally. One reason that is is because they are, are there to set to service the credit needs of the community as their uh, charter states. With the larger banks, they're looking to really – do larger transactions. Uh, you'll usually find them in large metros, and their commercial loan officers are looking for the deals that are in the $10 million plus. Um, anything underneath that really doesn't fit their credit culture. So with a community bank, who, someone who's looking to start a um, rental portfolio, it's a great place to go because their credit terms are not going to be any looser than a big bank, but they're willing to um, begin relationships with people because um, of their purpose for fulfilling the needs of their community. Yeah. And and that's, I think, the exciting part about community banks is that it, it seems like real estate investors and community banks are a good partnership because we're both kind of operating in the same space where if I go to, without picking on anybody, Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo, they're really looking for volume they're looking for bigger deals where the community banks are not more hungry but like that they're more maybe set up um or maybe I, i'm a bigger fish to a community bank than i would be to bank of america is, is is that right am i thinking about this the right way no you are thinking about it the correct way uh, bank of america the chase wells fargo they deal with large, high net worth individuals, and they also deal with large corporations, um, mm -hmm. real estate development. Right. While the um, community banks are well positioned to help those, you know, whether it's just uh, someone who's starting a small LLC or a partnership with a, a buddy, or they themselves are going about individually, because the transactions are smaller, they're able to provide more hands-on attention and be able to walk the customer through the lending process because they're not chasing the big deals. They're looking for um, smaller loans, such as, you know, someone who's trying to start a loan portfolio. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now where things get interesting are the different sides of the bank. So there's the retail side, 
that's more consumer focused. And then there's the commercial side, which is more business focused. Can you explain to me the the difference, uh, if there's more to it, uh, about the two different sides of the bank? Yes. So with the retail side, you're looking for being able to um, where you purchase a vehicle or you're looking for a home equity loan or you're looking to um, you go for a mortgage for purchase money to be able to buy a home, whether it's going to be your primary residence or a um, vacation home. In some instances, there are products to where they can uh, offer um, a be able to fulfill credit needs for people who are trying to start a credit portfolio for single family or one to four family dwellings. Where commercial comes in, it's really for people who are having, um, who have more than just a small amount of loans. So they're looking to really um, ramp up their size of their portfolio because they're able to be able to get credit usually a little quicker. And sometimes for people who are trying to take advantage of a deal, time is uh, the importance of closing a real estate deal. Now, th- there are some big differences between the loans that they offer for investors. So uh, we're talking buying rental properties. And so you could, you could, as an investor, get your loans through the retail side or you could get your loans through the commercial side. And there's, g- there's different trade-offs depending on which way you go, right? That is correct, Dan. So, I think a lot of people are familiar with, uh, you know, with the, the residential mortgage. There, if they go through a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, there, it's more difficult to buy a investment property and put it through the secondary market guidelines. Um, that's a little bit more rigid. Where, if you go through the community bank, you're able to. Um, they're still underwriting guidelines, but they're not as strict for borrowers who are trying to buy, um, you know, whether it's buy a property at foreclosure or already buy an existing property that's already cash flowing with rental. So if you're looking to purchase your first property, you could probably go through both of them. But if you're going to really, if you're looking for um, to be able to turn a deal quickly, I would recommend people go on the commercial side, especially once they get about five or more it's usually banks want to put those products into the commercial side because um, of re- really uh, regulatory guidelines. Okay. Now, w- what about um, LLCs? Uh, a lot of times people have trouble trying to get loans in an LLC. But on the commercial side, you guys kind of expect that, right? You, you're more maybe set up to loan under an LLC. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So, whether you're doing a, choosing to do an S corp, a C corp, or an LLC, uh, the commercial side is well positioned for that, and they're and that's what they expect. So, it is very very difficult to try to get if you're trying to start a business, um, whether it is a limited liability company, and go through the secondary market as opposed to a commercial bank that's going to hold the note themselves personally. So. And that is a perfect example of why you would want to, if you're looking to start a real estate holding company and keep all your properties underneath the holding company, then go through the the commercial division of the bank. Now, the trade-off, though, is that you're not, through commercial, you're not going to be able to get a 30-year fix generally, right? uh, Aren't most of the commercial loans like 20 years or 25 years? That is correct. You would um, probably going to have to get a shorter amortization schedule, so you're not going to be able to have as long um, by having a commercial note. Additionally, you're going to also have to personally guarantee the note. While on the other end, you know, if if you're not able to make the payments and the bank forecloses on it, you just walk away from from the uh, property and there's no recourse. But on the commercial end, there is recourse where the pro- if the bank is not able to sell the property for what they owe on it. They reserve the right to come after your personal assets. So there is a little bit of a risk mm. involved. So that's something to be for investors who right. are looking to get into. That's some of the pros and cons for them to weigh out. But um, usually the costs are a lot less. You know, if, so if someone who's trying to come out of pocket, there's a lot less closing costs, for, usually for a commercial mortgage than there is for um, a secondary mortgage. Really? Okay. Is it a pretty big difference? Between the two? It's usually going to run – it's probably going to run about um, 
probably about 5% of your closing cost. So if, if you're looking to buy, let's say, a $100,000 home, then you're probably looking at about $5,000 5, okay. difference. Okay. Now, what about um, bundling properties together? So say I, I have five rental properties and I want to bundle them into one mortgage. Is that something that's possible with the commercial loans? It is. And that's one reason why you would go through commercial. You couldn't do that through the uh, alternative. So, and that, by being able to bundle those together, you would also be able to, um, what a lot of people like to do, um, whether it's try to get a cash out, so then they can take the equity out of those properties and then buy more properties. Okay. So, and that's a perfect example of why people want to go through their commercial dealer or commercial lender for uh, that kind of transaction. Some of the loan terms that I've seen, there's a balloon or maybe the rate adjusts after five years or 10 years. Uh, are commercial loans the kind of thing where you're going to constantly need to refi every few years? There are some loans, and I would encourage uh, your listeners to you know shop around for banks that do offer fully amortizing commercial notes. Um, for the bank that I work for, we do offer fully amortizing commercial notes for one to four family dwellings. So that way it saves borrowers the cost and the headache of having to refinance mm-hmm. every you know so often for uh, a balloon maturity. And, and so your rate is going to change. Like So your rate might be locked in for five years, but after five years, it may change on a commercial loan, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. correct. So if it's a five-year fix with a balloon, then... When you refinance, it's whatever the market rate is at that time. If you do an adjustable rate mortgage, so then it will readjust based on whatever the index is, um, and that's written in the note. Uh, so your, but yeah, you're right. You are susceptible to rate changes, but generally banks put in caps on those notes to kind of quell any concerns that borrowers may have about seeing a spike in interest rates. So they'll usually put two percent caps or three percent caps on adjustments so that way it doesn't scare off borrowers. Coming up on the Rental Income Podcast. I want to talk to Elliot about what exactly the banks are looking for with commercial loans. Are they looking at your personal income and credit and your debt to income ratio or are they more concerned with the deal? So we're going to get into that in just a second. But first, I want to take a quick second and thank our sponsor today, FreshBooks.com. FreshBooks has been totally redesigned and custom built for the way that you work as a real estate investor. A couple of the features that I just love with FreshBooks is how easy it is to create and send invoices to my tenants. It takes literally 30 seconds to send out an invoice, and it's a great gentle way to remind a tenant that the rent is coming due. There's no formatting. There's no formulas. It's just real simple, clean, and professional looking. The other thing that I love is that there's no more waiting for checks to come in the mail. With literally two clicks, you can set yourself up to receive online payments. And then I also love their app. I I can easily track my income and expenses. And when tax time comes, all I have to do is send a report over to my CPA and I'm done. No more worries. No more no more headaches with tax time. FreshBooks is offering a 30 day unrestricted free trial to my listeners to claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash RIP and enter rental income podcast in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com slash RIP and enter rental income podcast in the how did you hear about us section. All right, let's get back to the interview. So Elliot, tell me what exactly are the banks looking for when they're deciding if they're going to make a loan or not? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, especially with community banks, if you have an existing relationship with the bank, whether it's where your deposits already rest or if you already have some small credit relationship, whether it's through a credit card or a car loan, then we want to be able to see if you've been able to not just um, what your FICO credit score is, but also because we're trying to develop a relationship you know, what existing relation do you have? So if you do have deposits or other products with the bank, you know, the bank is more eager to try to work with you, especially if it's a marginal credit, you know, where it could kind of go both ways. Uh, but as far as our guidelines, criteria, you know, we look for loan to value. So banks for one to four family dwelling are probably going to lend right around 80% for the value of the property. So the a, Appraised value of a property is 100000 Banks will probably go up to 80000 for a loan. Okay, so you would need a $20,000 down payment in that example. Yeah, right. yeah, 20000 okay. 20%. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And then what about debt-to-income? Like, How does 
how does that work? Like, what, what are you looking for there? So banks want to make sure that the person or people who are applying for credit aren't overly extended in their personal lives because people are going to pay for their, for their more personal mortgage for, first or any other debts before they pay uh, a commercial note. Mm-hmm. So they want to make sure that you're not using um, all the funds from your uh, net operating income from those rental properties just to uh, you know create more of a financial distress. So banks are going to look for your usually what we like to see is a 45 percent debt to income so they'll okay. take your monthly debts and divide it by your monthly income and that creates your debt to income ratio okay now I, i've always heard that with commercial loans they're more concerned about the deal than the, the borrower is is that true it, it sounds like you're you're really looking for a strong borrower but are, are you also taking the deal into consideration that's really by each institution. Some people want to, um, in, in their bank's credit culture, um, I would say that for smaller banks, they can feel more comfortable with a strong deal, but um, that rests within the credit culture of each okay. bank. So okay. with our bank, we, we certainly also want the borrowers to be to, to pass the litmus test. Right. Okay. And what kind of reserves do you want to see from a borrower? Now, that's important. Um, so banks want to be able to see that you have about a month and a half of payment reserves for each mortgage that you have. So if you have one mortgage for one property, about a month and a half payment because they want to be able to see that you have the ability to, if there is a vacancy, where money will come out uh, of that reserve, as well as anticipated, updated uh, cost for repairs and maintenance that come with any property. Mm-hmm. And so be able to see that's going to be come out of your reserves as opposed to put on credit to um, fill in that short-term period. Okay. So if I have 10 properties, they all rent for $1,000 a month, you guys want to see ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in reserves somewhere around there, right? Yeah, that's, okay. that's exactly right. Perfect. Okay. Now l- let's talk about the, another metric that uh, a lot of commercial lenders use the the debt service coverage ratio. Um, that I think confuses a lot of people. It, is do you have a quick and easy way to explain what that is? Yeah, the, really the simplest way is to describe it and to boil it down in the simplest form is if you take your monthly mortgage payment plus including your insurance and taxes. What that payment is, you want to multiply it by 1.3, and that would get you a 1.3 debt service coverage. So if okay. your monthly mortgage payment with tax and insurance is 1000 bucks, then look for renting that property out for 1300 bucks. And the reason why banks want to see that, because they want to be able to know first that the property is cash flowing positive. So it's, it's actually an investment. It's not a cash dump. Secondly, they want to be able to see that you, you have a cushion there. So when things do go wrong with the home, you'll be able to use the reserves that that property creates, the the income that it creates, to uh, do the uh, maintenance and repairs. Okay. Okay. Now, tell me, if I was going to try to engage with you, I I want to to be a customer of of you and and your bank. What's the best way for someone to do that? Is it data-driven, where you want me to fill out an application and you're going to look at it, or... It, would I want to come in there and sit down with you and meet you face to face and try to develop a relationship with you? Like, what what kind of advice could you give me and and the listeners? Uh, due to regulations, there is a point that is data driven, so we do have to uh, make sure that we ha- be able to collect financials and a credit application, personal financial statement, because when our regulators come behind us, they want to make sure that. We underwrote the risk fairly. However, there is a great deal of intangibleness that can be weighted based on a person's reputation in the community. If you come in, there's a great deal of just being able to sit across from them, a banker and explain to them you know, what you're looking to accomplish, your, uh, whether you're just getting into the industry or you're a seasoned investor who has many properties in their portfolio. But bankers want to be able to expand their customer base. So there's a great deal of value to actually meet with your banker and allow them to um, see what your story is, both with your 
previous profession as well as what your goals and ambitions are for the future. Okay. I know an investor that put together a book. He owns a bunch of properties and he, he has a little book that has pictures of his properties and information on what he purchased it for, uh, what, what the rental history has been, how much he rents the property out for. Is something like that helpful to you as as a banker or is that maybe just a little bit of overkill? No, it's extremely helpful. The more information that we have, the better we can um, position you for approval for your loan. Okay. Because, you know, the when bankers look at it and they got to take the request to a credit analyst, the analyst, you know, their job is to look at all the reasons why we shouldn't make the loan. And the loan officer is tried to, to be fair and balanced, tries to point all the reasons why we should make the loan with hope that the truth will be found in the middle. Mm-hmm. So by showing that, um, you know, if a customer showed that they lost a thousand dollars on the property over the course of the year, so it did not have a positive cash flow, but they've got pictures of showing all the improvements that they made to the property just to find the loss. You know, it, those little things create great value for a borrower to be able to, if it's not a slam dunk deal, to get the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Now, what about if you had something big happen? Like maybe you had to put a new roof on a property. So it's a property that maybe has been profitable, but you had a big expense. So on paper, it doesn't maybe look like a good investment. Is there a way to maybe get around that or for the bank to make an exception? Or are, are banks generally going to look at that and maybe not think as highly as that property? No, I mean, all properties have general wear and tear. So it is understood that um, large upgrades are going to have to be made. So in a case like that, obviously show be able to, to document the um, improvements that were made to the property, such as what the reference you made to a gentleman who had a book and pictures uh, and keeping receipts. Additionally, you know, banks will usually ask for the past three years. So that way, if you have one off year, you know, you'll have you can show the pr- other two years that justify how the property is an income producing property. Okay. Okay. Is there any advice you can give for maybe someone that's that's newer, or maybe someone that's going to take their portfolio to the next level, and maybe they're a little bit scared to take on leverage and take on more debt? Is there any advice that you would give them as a banker and as someone that's seen a lot of investors? Like, is there anything that, like, maybe makes people more successful taking on leverage and something else that maybe is a red flag? So I deal with a lot of investors, and you know, there's some properties that are more successful than others, but I've never come across investors who have become financially distressed by who put quite a bit of equity infusion into the home. So if they're able to bring a lot of cash into the home and not have to leverage the property to the hills, so even they'll be able to have a lower principal and interest payment as a result. Therefore, if they do go a month or two without tenants, it doesn't ruin them. And Mm -hmm. so, and because they haven't leveraged their other properties, they can weather those storms better. So I would definitely say you want to be able to grow, but grow with caution. Don't just... Um, take out a bunch of debt if you've never done it for the first time and want to buy five properties in the first year. I would recommend a more of a um, methodical approach. And if you're, you can't go wrong by putting in a, a large piece of uh, down payment because you're going to be able to offer, charge less rent because the bank's going to be off, you know, charging you. And therefore, you're more likely to be able to find a tenant because you're below market as far as the rent that you're having to charge. Okay. So the the bigger down payment, the the safer the deal is. Basically, is yeah, absolutely a way to look at it. Even if you can't um, find a tenant, if, if if worse comes worse, if you just have to sell a property, then you're more likely to be able to get your you know at least recoup what you owe to the bank because you bit, put such a large amount down. Awesome. Well, Elliot, if someone wants to reach out to you, if if they're they're looking for a banker, why don't you tell us how someone can reach out to you and what areas y- your bank lends in. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so um, my office is in Stanton, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, and I personally um, can help customers all over the state of Virginia. 
But uh, you know, so I work for City National Bank, uh, City National Bank of West Virginia. We're headquartered out of Charleston, West Virginia, and my number um, or my email, excuse me, is Elliot E L L I O T T dot K U E L Z at bankatcity dot com. Awesome. And I will go ahead and, and put a link to that in case you missed it on our show notes page. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 126. Elliot, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.